Pearson and Parsons, both cars flat out, wound out, and running for the wire. Look out! On the back chute, Pearson is loose. Unbelievable! David Pearson, with only three laps to go, came up fast behind a slower car. He cut quickly to the outside and just flat lost it. His long spinner, all the way down the back straight, just handed the lead to Benny Parson. And right now, this record crowd of over 110,000 are on their feet, screaming and waving this white Chevy number 72 on to the wind. And I'm sure there's no one at the Speedway more thrilled and surprised than Benny himself. Benny comes down off the high bank fourth turn for the last time today and onto the trioval. Right now he has to be all smiles as he whips under the checkered flag. Winner of the richest stock car race in the world, the Daytona 500. The crew of the Kings Row Chevy go wild as they head for Victory Lane to await the arrival of their ex-Detroit cab driver. Daytona International Speedway is famous for cliffhangers, but you'd have to go a long way to match this one. When Benny got out of the car, Victory Lane looked a little like a theater in the round, with every type of emotion on display. The statement we heard him repeat the most was, I don't believe. But with a bevy of beauties, the governor's cup, and a check for over $41,000, you could become a believer in an awful hurry. David Pearson finished fourth and earned about $25,000 less. It was an expensive spin-out. But to Benny Parsons, it meant his day in the sun. And to stock car racing, another new hero. I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with everybody and reminisce and you know, it brings back a lot of good memories, sure does. a lot of happy times, and I thank you. I was crying on John Hill's shoulder one day, who was running the operation for Mr. DeWitt, a boy from Ellerby, and we were moaning and groaning about bad luck is what we were talking about. Uh, the Ford representative saw us talking and said, you know, there's maybe a shot to stay in the racing business. His driver, LG's driver, is hurt. He needs a driver, and you need a car. So on the way back from Daytona, I stopped and saw Mr. DeWitt. And the place that, you know, I'm sure all of you realize this, but maybe there's somebody from out of town, where LG's place is is not Norman and it's not LB, it's DeWitt Junction, right? Uh, Benny came along and he went up to Richmond. He, he drove a marvelous race up there. John Hill, he said, you know, that's the kind of driver we need. He said, he just passed those people and went on and made one of the best drives that we've had. And then came on to Rockingham uh, the following week and ran that race. And after that weekend, he said, uh, Buddy's doctor is going to be two or three months. Do you want the job driving? I, I didn't want to work on taxi cabs, believe me. <laughs> I, wanted to work, I wanted to work on the race cars. In 73, we had a big year, won the championship, and we had some nice moments. In 74, I felt like we had the world conquered and we were going to be off and running, and it did not turn out that way. And I wanted to get away from the racing. I said, there's got to be something out there I can do, because evidently I can't do the racing business. And LG talked me out of it and said, look, let's give it one more shot. Let's try it again. And we did. Went to Daytona and won the Daytona 500 in 1975. And uh, I just wonder if I hadn't, you know, if I hadn't had that victory and that, because it was so special, not only for me, but I'm sure it was for LG. And thank goodness he did talk me on that December day into sticking around and and coming back to drive again. Benny Parson has let the whole United States know where Richmond County, where Ellaby is, where Norman is, where uh, Rockingham and Hamlet, the North Carolina Motor Speedway, and he has been a friend to this community. Mr. 
Wood, a lot of times he, he would say that he moved people around, tried to find a job that, they, that suited them, that they enjoyed, that they were good at. He had a lot of different opportunities and he moved people around till, till he found what they uh, were good at. Mr. DeWitt, as we've stated in several different ways, had an ability to motivate people in such a way to get them to put forth their best effort. Mr. DeWitt made sure that everything went perfect, you know, in, in that way because in his position, if it didn't go perfect, it would fall back on him and he wasn't about to have that. He was a person that throughout the industry, it was an honor to work for. He was well respected by Motors, the different track for motors. Uh, I know he was pretty close with Junior Johnson. And uh, of course the Petties had an awful lot of respect for him. So it was a, it was a good opportunity for me. He had a, an uncanny knack for dealing with people and personalities. I mean, it's not something that's trained. I mean, it's inherent ability that he had that very few people have. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? I mean, just the subtle ways of getting through it. It wasn't a raised voice and it wasn't a slap, you know, point your finger. It was just a calm demeanor all the time. But the message, you know, ran strong and deep. That's right. That's like the story I told Tex on last about going after a raise and get through with you apologize to him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We were going to the first race at Riverside in those days, so he had to go out there first. So he says, you know, I'm going to give you a little map of some way stations, and you won't drive through them. You'll go around back, and you'll say, unload a box of peaches or fruit or something and take it in the back door and say, Mr. DeWitt, sorry you missed your Christmas, but this is, this is for you. And, he, and they would never... The fact you went behind the way station, you went, didn't go across the scale, so you were okay. And he said, uh, you know, he said, the rest of them, you'll just have to go. Oh, go, not go on the scale, just go right on down the highway. And he said, I'll, if you get stopped, I'll help you. I'll take care of you. I said, I'll, with whatever the fine is, I'll, but then he said, if you go across the scale, I'm not going to help you. So whistled on and there was never, nobody ever came out after me or any, and there was never a problem. So he had the, he had the system figured out. He, it's, he told me the same thing when I left to go to Pennsylvania to work for Roger Penske. I remember sitting down in that office over there with him and talking about it and he said, it's an opportunity you gotta go take. And that was his attitude. Yeah, I mean, who knows, he, in his heart of hearts, he might have been glad I was leaving but that's not the impression you had. You're thinking, hey, you know, this guy gave me a chance. My first opportunity, I felt bad about going. But, you know, that's life and that's progression, if you, if you will. And, he, and actually, it, it turned out that he gave me a good opportunity. He actually had an opportunity to make his team a lot better. As it, you know, we brought Jake in and Waddell came on and got that sponsor in the year after that. So, well, not a fact, no, it was a year after that or so, but. Uh, so it all was a win-win for everybody. But he wasn't a guy that's, you know, ranting and raving and throwing it in your face. Well, I gave you a chance. Somebody else gave you it. Doing me wrong. He didn't have that at T-Force with him. It was like, hey, that's an opportunity for you. You earn work. And if, you, if it's something you want to go do, go pursue it. And, and he gave you his step of approval, <coughs> his blessing for it. And that's the way I think he treated a lot of people. All of his people. From the start, I took that few of people and, and the people on the, on the pit crew that came from the farm up there and they, I mean they weren't nearly as fast as some of them but they could compete with them yeah. and after a little while you know they weren't professional athletes and, and yeah. did a heck of a job I can tell you that yeah, yeah they did but two things with that I think he was a guy who knew that he couldn't it wasn't fair to try to stop somebody from something and I think to his uh, credit. He was a guy that also had the confidence in a good way that, hey, I found you to do the job. There's somebody else that I can mold and get adjusted and learn how to do this job as well. Because it just, 
And that's the guy that never feels defeated. You know, he, he's just not gonna, he's never gonna feel beaten. But he's gonna, in his way, in his mind, he's, he's gonna find a way. <coughs> And, I, and we have to admire that. I mean, we truly admire people like that. I do. Always have. Well, I think that someone who has that big picture look, you know, to be able to look at things and see the very biggest picture and do things the right way and treat people the right way, it comes back around to them. You know, if you, I think, and, and that's something that, you know, I think he instilled in all of us. I think we're... I know I'm certainly a better person from my experiences with him and Benny, both. I guess I probably never, until this evening, might not have never really realized it, but all through my career, you know, of working with people or managing people on teams, uh, I'm, the, I'm the last guy to try to fire somebody, and I always was. But my philosophy was like Mr. DeWitt, so maybe it just inherently came from him. Hey, you know, first of all, if I hired them, I mean, it's, it's a reflection on me, the caliber of capable person they are, the quality person they are. So it was my desire to find a way to make it right. You know, like you say, you might have to put them in a different role or move somebody around here and there, but find a way to make it mesh and don't just, constant personnel turnover is not the answer. So, you know, Mr. DeWitt's philosophy wasn't that, and I, I probably, like I say, inherently uh, developed that maybe from him. He understood family, and he understood how one decision here can impact not only the individual or the employee, but a whole group of people, being the people, person's family or whatever. And I think he was always conscious of that throughout his businesses. I mean, he, I've always heard stories, kind of good, kind stories about him in that regard. Was you there when Benny was running in Michigan and I mean, fire extinguisher blowed up? Yeah, yeah. It broke the wells out of the floor. Yeah, and he got a shot at winning. I mean, yeah. they were back and forth for the lead. Yeah, and he went off and he just reaches up and switches. It Thought off. the motor blew up. Yeah, yeah. But he realized that by the time he got it switched back on, he done lost the draft. Yeah. Who well with Benny? Probably put in a band. I would think. You know, at uh, Rockingham winning the championship, that was that was huge. It still ranks up there. I mean, I I don't know how you ever would top that. Uh, the home track for the car owner. Uh, you know, just the drama that was connected. Well, you could never write a story with more. Mm. Um, and there was a, you know, you mentioned there was a good bit of preparedness in case, at that time you could change engines. So, you know, the top contenders, top three cars that, that had a shot at winning, it all had a motor hanging there on the, on the hoist. But we had, but nobody had that van pull up and slid that door up with all that stuff in it, but Tex and the Bars boys. Richie Bars and his brother, Leslie, and Jimmy Kowalczyk and the whole crowd. We brought every, it looked like the shop was empty when right. we came. Brought everything and it was, there, there was serious preparation. And you know, usually when you do it, it's like when you carry a spare tire, you don't have a flat. Yeah. And, and that was, and sure enough, he run like 12, 13 laps and boom. And I remember Rich and Les inside the car, you know, ruptured the gas line. And, get, and yeah, kept lighting kept, up. Yeah. Cutting towards it going fire. And you'd hear him holler. But it out, it never stopped cutting. The fire things were going. They got the torches going wide, and they catch on fire, and they catch and, on. And that was and that was. Turn on the gas, out, and then. And, and like the part where you said that uh, Moody brought that Ralph Moody brought that car up, and uh, we cut the bars out of the side of it, and then uh, after it was over, I think that guy, the owner of that car, Bobby Musgrave, what what it wasn't his. He was the driver, but I don't think he was the owner. Oh, I did not thought he was the owner. There's a woman involved. There's a somehow. woman, that's oh, right. Yeah. And she was very displeased. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, went out, she, she basically got a pretty new car out of it. So. Well, he sent the car to our shop. We we cut the bars back out of the, that car, fit them back in that same car, the same bars, put them back in. And that car had a uh, like a stock snout on it, a Chevelle snout. 
and they wanted a, like a Holman snout, a fabricated snout. So we put a fabricated snout on it, and then uh, y'all might have painted it. I or think something. we had to I paint. I can painted. remember the color of the old ugly gold color. At the barn. Yeah, the, all that, and they had the banner pre-made, but somewhere the banner had got wadded up and thrown away. You, you, you recall that? No. <laughs> if you'll notice pictures of it, that they had to get that banner out and flatten it back out. It was plastic. When Benny had the, invited us all to come to that last race, that's that Richie Bars had noticed it, he and he discussed it, and Benny had noticed it, that, oh, really? that the banner that had been crumpled up. Because you thought, well, somebody was glad we wasn't going to win there for a minute, you know, and that was kind of disappointing. You didn't know who it was, but you didn't like it, you know. Benny, you know, the, the thoughtfulness of, for him to invite us to that uh, was, was real special. You know, you ask uh, if I still have my shirt, and yeah, I'll, I'll always have my shirt. You know. It'll hang in my, this is the first time I've worn it since then, but you know, that, that was a real special deal, and he'll never know how special it was to us. You know. If you went to people that knew Benny Parsons and you said, give me a list of your top five friends, your five best friends, Benny Parsons' name would be on 2,000 people's list. He was a good friend, an excellent friend to an awful lot of people, more than any human I've ever known. Benny really loved to drive a race car, okay? And when everything was right, there wasn't nobody better than Benny. He was the kind of guy that really never asked for anything, but he said, Tex, don't let everybody forget me. Tex Powell honored Parsons' last wishes, ensuring his racing legacy would never be forgotten. A friend of mine, he said he found, found a car. I had no idea that it was the championship car. So he sends me some pictures of it. I show the pictures to Richie and he verifies that this is the one we won the championship with. And they said, well, let's just restore the thing. Let's put it back like it was. A lot of these restorations you see, they're not the original car. This car is an original. We used a lot of the original tools that we used actually when we built the car the first time. It's been a lot of fun doing it like it was in 1973. Putting this car together, we, we talk about things he said and what he did. It's been a real neat deal to be able to talk about old times and stuff that happened. None of us will forget. It's just been neat. It's been a lot of fun. It has been for me. There's a lot of people that have helped. We had one guy, he stops by. And he said, you got to have to have it media blasted. And we said, yeah, we really want to. He said, well, I want to do that for you. He said, when I was eight years old, our family stops by DeWitt Junction, look at the car. Benny Parson comes out of the office. And he says, son, you want to sit in a race car? He said, oh, of course I did. So Benny helps him get in the car. He never forgot that. I feel bad that Benny's not here to see it. He left us early. I mean, we miss him. I know he's looking down on us and smiling today. And now.
just owned a few others and me. I guess it's because I kind of changed my 